Hey guys, welcome to the second episode of Lukey Builds. Apologies for my last week's lack of ep video due to exams and stuff. Anyway, this week we're building the Avro Vulcan. The Avro Vulcan is a British made bomber used during the Cold War, before the onset of ballistic missiles. Its first flight was on the 30th of August 1952, and it was officially retired in 1984. And without further ado, let's get straight into it. Alright, here I am in the space plane hangar using the B9 Aerospace's um, hypersonic capsule again. Just like last time. And as always, this is sped up, otherwise me build, watching me build something for 20 minutes would not be very interesting. Well, earlier prototypes had a completely delta wing, which had a few problems including often getting into an uncontrollable dive at high speeds due to the vortex generated on the upper surface. They solved this with the Phase 2 wing, which featured a kinked and drooped leading edge, as you can see me working on here, as the leading edge of the wing is not perfectly straight. Interesting thing about the Vulcan, even though it was designed before a low radar cross-section and other stealth factors were even considered, a study in 1957 found that, the Vul that on a very few bits of the Vulcan contributed significantly to its radar signature. Now while we're working on the tail, it's interesting to note that the Vulcan's tail was often packed full of defensive equipment. Such equipment included ECM jammers, early detection radar, as well as bog standards, um, infrared distraction flares. The Vulcan's four engines were housed in pairs alongside the fuselage embedded in the wings. All variants of the Vulcan had some version of the Bristol Sidley Olympus engines. Earlier designs had all four engines clumped together in the fuselage, with the two separate bomb bays in the wings, with a with two vertical stabilizers on the wingtips, as opposed to the single in the center in the current model. This configuration was abandoned due to the requirements of certain weapons to be able to fit in the bomb bays, hence the bomb bay was moved to the center of the fuselage where it could be much larger. Anyway, here I am attaching the fuel tanks, um, embedding them inside the wings, using the clip through everything glitch, and attaching the fuel lines appropriately. And more or less, and with that, the Vulcan is ready to fly. Let's see how this thing goes. Well, we haven't exploded yet, so that's always a good start. Well, let's compare this thing to how it looks to, um, to its real-life counterpart. Well, from the top, it does bear quite a resemblance, at least in the wing shape. However, from the side, um, yeah, I could not quite get the cockpit to stick out, mainly due to the um, limitations of the parts I had. And apart from the fact that I couldn't quite get the tail to stick out just right, but apart from that, I think it's still quite a fair representation of the Vulcan. And with that, let's start up our engines and fly. Throttling up. And it does accelerate pretty well for something this big. And pitching back, and it takes off quite well as well. The turn's not too bad, and the roll's not too bad either. Oh, it looks like a pretty decent airplane. Let's see what else this thing can do. As I see, I'm um, putting it into a barrel roll. Yes, that is a barrel roll, in which if you perform a... when you um, both pull back on the stick and roll at the same time, in which you sort of do a corkscrew. During the 1955 um, Farnborough Air Show, one of the pilots uh, flying the Vulcan was demonstrating its maneuverability and executed a barrel roll. Interestingly, um, a couple of days later, he, he received an order from Civil Aviation Authority and ordered him to refrain from carrying out this, quote, dangerous maneuver. 
but nonetheless, I suppose to be a testament to the Vulcan's performance. Later versions of the Vulcan had their wings strengthened to allow for low altitude flying, as there was a, uh, a common tactic amongst NATO forces as it allows them to um, bypass surface to, uh, many surface-to-air defences on their um, attack. However, the Vulcan was not a very fast aircraft. It was only capable of 0 0.96 mark at its ceiling altitude of 17 kilometers. However, this was more than adequate for most tasks, except for its first and only operation during the Falklands War of 1982. Codenamed Operation Black Buck, it was a long-range bombing campaign against the Argentinian defences during the Falklands War, which consisted of a 13,000 km round trip. The main objectives of Operation Black Buck was to give the British air superiority during the initial and hopefully the whole of the Falklands. The first of these missions, Black Buck 1, was um, aimed at Port Stanley Airport, the main airfield on the island. It was tasked with dropping general purpose dumb bombs to hopefully crater the runway, rendering it unusable by the fast mirage jets of the Argentinian defenders. However, the nearest British controlled airfield was on Ascension Island six, some 6,000 kilometers away. But because the Vulcan did not have enough internal fuel, it had to be refueled many, many times. As a result, the refueling plan looked a bit like this. They had a big armada of Victor tankers, which would refuel each other at the first refueling point. And those first set of refueled tankers would then return to base. Then, at the second refueling point, the procedure would be repeated. And repeated. Until there was only the final Vulcan left. Now, the effects of that bombing mission is still debated today, because it only made one crater on the runway, and that was quickly repaired within 24 hours. But even then, the, the runway was still usable by C-130 transport planes and IA-58 ground attack aircraft. Propaganda analysts suggest that it also caused the Argentinians to pull lots of the mirages back to the mainland to protect against a further um, a potential um, strike on the mainland, but this was quickly undermined when the British government declared that there will be no strikes on the, main, on the mainland. Here we are in Kerbal Space Program, at an altitude of 10 kilometers. The Vulcan has exceeded its real-life counterpart's top speed of Mark 0.96. So, by far the Kerbal Space Program version does outperform its real-life counterpart. And with that done, let's bring her around for a landing. What I forgot to mention earlier was the, um, the Vulcan's payload. Typical payloads are just one typical nuclear bomb in the bomb bay. There are quite a few types that can fit in there, or 21 1,000 pound conventional bomb. Now the real life Vulcan has air brakes, air brake panels on the wings. Now, um, to be honest, in my version I kind of, well, forgot about them. And, but nonetheless, I can, I can land it without it, and you don't really need it in a Kerbal Space Program. Also, there is a, um, drag chute in the tail on the real life version, and unfortunately, you can't really use them as that as um, parachutes as that in Kerbal Space Program, because the second the wheels touch the ground, the parachutes undeploy, so you can't really use them as drag chutes. But anyway, we're coming in nice and slow now, it flies really well, even at low speeds, very controllable. Coming in nice and gentle landing. Alright, put on the brakes. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, is a good time to conclude. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.